Amen. If you got your Bibles with you this morning, let's open them to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, some of you don't know, but we've kind of been going down a road here where we're absolutely trying to figure out more about our adversary. Somebody said, shouldn't you know more about God? We are, let him say we quit studying God. But we're understanding as we study our adversary that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. We're also understanding, let me, let me just recap right quick. Uh, Satan was an angel. Uh, he was a, we might could call him heaven's worship leader. He was more beautiful than any of the others. He was more talented, more gifted than any of the others. But he fell because he made it about him. He, the Bible says he was struck down the earth at the speed of a lightning bolt. Like lightning, he hit the earth. Um, so we began to go down that road. Um, the problem is so few people go down this path. I myself found myself looking for a scripture that said, I am more powerful than Satan. You can come through the pages of your Bible. You will never find a scripture that says you are more powerful than Satan. Somebody said, that's why I keep losing the battle with sin. And you might be very right there. So, so listen, I'm looking for that certain verse that says I can win. I am more powerful than Satan. Um, and the truth is, is, is this. Ephesians 16 is our hope. It is our hope. Now, there's beauty in the word of God if you'll let it be. Ephesians 16, I'm going to read just a few right here. Paul would say to these people, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 12. And here's where a lot of traditional church people panic. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What does that mean? You can break up the committee to tear somebody down because it's not them that's causing you trouble. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You might should pinch yourself to remember what flesh and blood really is. Is everybody still okay this morning? Amen. Just checking. So, so, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, look at this scripture. Take up the whole armor of God. <laughs> Even the lights are getting nervous. Amen. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Think about that. Now, having done all to stand. Now, I looked at that text and I thought, Lord, my, my, my very first, maybe you look at it different, but my very first thought was, here's the truth, Lord. You want me just to stand and let the enemy throw his darts just to see which one sticks. You want me just to stand. God, I'm not really sure this is what I signed up for. Amen. I signed up for streets of gold and gates of pearl. I want a halo and some wings. Can anybody, did you sign up for that? Amen. I want to eat at the banquet table where the steak's always done just like I like it. Amen. Are y'all okay? You're hungry, but you'll be okay. <laughs> God, that's what I signed up for. And then I get to Ephesians, and if I take this at face value, at best on my best day, I can just stand. God, you've got to teach me something about what it means to stand. The Bible says if you want wisdom, ask for it, and that's exactly what he'll give you. Oh, Kurt. Can you get those two light switches in the back? Somebody said, Preacher, we'll have church in the dark. The sun's out, the windows are open. We'll be fine, I promise. <laughs> gotcha, devil. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, here we go. Um, so so here's, here's what I shared with you so far. And it would do us all well to remember that you cannot fight the devil. Let me explain. The devil is more powerful, and I'm going to be honest with you, don't take offense. He is wiser than you and I. Somebody said, Preacher, how can you, how can you prove that he is wiser? Well, he, he has been around a lot longer than you have. And we know with, with, with age comes wisdom. And all my senior saints should say that amen on that one. Uh, so we know that to be a truth. We, we also know that, that, that uh, he's been working on his craft for a very, very, very long time. We know that he was the most powerful and wise angel we believe that God ever created. Preacher, what are you trying to say? While Christians cannot take the offense, while we cannot fight Satan, we can stand our ground against his attacks. Let me help you out right quick by just helping you. Um, 
I do still teach public school. Somebody said, why? I think it's a calling. I'm just going to go there until they run me out. Amen. Uh, but I still I still do that kind of thing. And, and, and a couple years ago, there was a little skirmish in, in the hallway. And, and, and I went outside and, and I kind of looked at the, the video, you know, because we got video everywhere now. Somebody said, where'd you get video? Every kid had one. I just wanted to see it. So, so I watched as one kid walked from this side of the hall. Our, our hallway out there is about 45, 50 foot wide. It's significant. He walked all the way across the way. He tapped another man, looked like a young man on the shoulder. He's about six foot tall. And as that man turned around, he reached back, way back here. Did anybody ever got one from way back here? He reached way back here, and he hit that guy right across the face. It was a solid lick. It wasn't a glance. I'll be honest with you. I think it would have knocked most people to their knees. Ironically, the kid he hit, his head went back this way, and as it come back up, he looked at that kid and smiled. And that kid didn't know what to do then. When it was over, I seen him in the hallway. I said, young man, do you have any idea what you did? He said, I did, coach. I went up and I hit that boy square in the face. I said, how did that end? He said, he looked at me and smiled. I said, if you had any sense, you'd be really worried right now. If you gave him your best lick and he just stood there and smiled at you. He walked away scratching his head because he figured he didn't know what it meant. But I look at this scripture right here and I think about that old boy when Satan comes at you. And the Bible says if you put on the whole armor of God, you're going to be able to withstand what the enemy throws at you. That means when he hits you with his best punch, you can look back at him and smile knowing, you know what, this might hurt for a moment. But the glory of God that I shall receive shall not be compared with what I'm going to receive right now. Are y'all still all right? Amen. Don't get quiet on me now. Here we go. Oh. Um, so I want to talk about standing. The first thing that cannot be overlooked is the opposite of standing. The Bible says that you can stand. Somebody said, what's the opposite of standing? I, I try to find good politically correct words to, to, to put into the sermon, but often I cannot be politically correct and biblically accurate. You understand there's differences there. So, so the word that really goes in here is, is the opposite of standing is being a coward. Somebody said, what is a coward? By definition, a coward is a person who lacks the courage to do unpleasant things. Think about that. Do you know you can look in Scripture? We can find a text that says there's a, car a carnal Christian. Now, we would debate whether they're really a Christian or not, but that's for another day. But we can find that text. Do you know what you will not find in Scripture? You'll never find in Scripture a cowardly Christian. Do you know why? Because there's not a such a thing as a cowardly Christian. You're either standing on the promises of God. You are a believer, born again, bought with the blood. Or the truth is you are not. Well, Brother Mark, I just want you to understand, I, I think there is such a thing as a cowardly Christian. My friend, you have been deceived because cowardice never wins against Satan. Only courage does. Only courage does. Now, as Paul speaks this, it's been a time that we struggle. We, we, we struggle to, to really comprehend what is happening. But the crowd that he is speaking to would, would recognize that this would be a characteristic, the standing of a Roman centurion, a Roman soldier, that would be able to resist, stand fast, not to give way when hard pressed. I, I think about some of those soldiers in England, you know, who stand there with the big hats on and all their stuff, and people walk up and they mock them and they don't win. How do they do that? Think about it. I mean, you look at them, it's like they're not even breathing. Are they really alive? But here's what we know. They are standing just the same. Somebody said we ought to be standing, and we should. Now, so here's what we need to be alerted as a believer. We must constantly remember that Satan's desire is the number one doubt, to deny, to disregard, and to disobey everything that God has told you in his word about you and your life. So be strengthened by the Spirit. Be clothed with God's full armor and resist him. Did you catch that? Somebody said, Preacher, you told me to stand there. But when we stand, we resist. And James tells us in James chapter 4, Therefore submit unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Now you, you hang on because this is going to get better. Somebody said, Brother Mark, how much does God's armor cost? <laughs> Do you understand how smart God is? He never asked you to buy anything you could not afford. Think about that for just a minute. And somebody said, well, Brother Mark, whose armor is it? It's God's armor. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. But, but here's the problem. God's given every believer, I believe, the armor of God. It is his. It's his gift to you, just like salvation. I know you struggle with that, but salvation, too, is a gift. He's given it to you. So here's, here's the problem with most believers. Preacher, I understand that, but if I put that on, that's going to make me like a warrior. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. It's going to make you like a warrior for Christ everywhere that you go. Um, so God paid for it. God's gift to you. The truth is we just got to put it on. So let me, let me back up a minute and make sure you don't miss it. You have the responsibility of God to put on his armor every day of your life. Amen. No, Brother Mark, God just dressed me. He did that. You got skin. Now put on his armor. Amen. Some of y'all get that later. But if I look at James chapter 4, before we can resist the devil and he will flee, the Bible says that we've got to submit unto God. In other words, you've got to humble yourself before God. It is a humble man or a woman that Satan will flee from, not one who is filled with pride or arrogance. You say, preacher, what does that mean? We've talked about what the devil is and what the devil is not. One preacher said it this way. Many believe that the devil is red. Because of some fairy tale. But the truth is, that you think about that. It's amazing that God has given Christians the power to resist the greatest creature ever made. Don't forget, he was created. He is anointed, but he is still a creature. The devil is mighty, but he is not invincible. Some people act as if the devil is almighty, but he is not. And if you think the devil is almighty, you have made a sad mistake. You say, preacher, why? The devil cannot lead a man or a woman into sin without the consent of that person's will. In other words, listen now, that old, that, old, that old phrase we used to throw around that says the devil made me do it, that is not possible. The devil cannot make you to do it. But what he'll do is he'll entice you to the sin that's already in your heart. You'll be led away by your own enticing, and then you'll give to sin. And the Bible says when you give to sin and it is conceived, it brings forth death. Well, that's just the truth. We don't have to like it. Wednesday night, this is what we learned. We learned that in order for the devil to enter your heart, you have to open the door of your heart. We learned that there's a doorknob on your heart, but it's only on the inside. It can only be opened from the inside out. So if you've given the devil access to your life, or if he has access to your life, you have given it to him at some point in time. Listen, I love you, but if you can open the door and let him in, with God's help, you can kick him out and close the door. Can I get a witness from somebody? Amen. I think this morning, spirits of the devil ought to get an eviction notice on some hearts in the room. Amen. But before we can stand before Satan, we've got to bow before God. Think about that for just a minute. I don't know of anybody, I work with young people all week long, and, and, and I don't know of anybody in life that wants to be a loser. Think about it. You don't want to be a loser. You don't want to be a loser at your job. You don't want to be a loser at your marriage. You don't want to be a loser as a parent. You just really don't want to be a loser. And then we come to church, and that preacher, who's about four and a half foot tall, ain't got much hair left on his head, says you can't beat the devil, and now you feel like a loser. Let me help you out. Let me do it this way. National Geographic ran an article about an Alaska bull moose. The male of the species battle for dominance during the fall breeding season, literally going head to head with antlers crunching together as they collide. Often antlers, their only weapon, are broken off, which ensures defeat. But the heaviest moose with the largest and strongest antlers will triumph. Therefore, the battle fought in the fall, listen now, is really won during the summer when the moose eats continually. And the one that consumes the best diet for growing strong antlers and gaining weight will be the heavyweight in the fight in the fall. Somebody said, Preacher, what in the world does that have to do with anything? But it has to do with this. Spiritual battles are not won when they arise. They're won when you spent time with God before that battle ever showed itself in your life. Right. And how often have we been guilty of, Oh Lord, help me, I'm about to die. Amen. Well, where have you been for the last nine months? I think sometimes what heaven is saying. We've been trying to work with you. Heaven's been trying to speak into your life. And the truth is often we, we just kind of miss it. We wait until all of a sudden it's almost too late. Thank God it's not too late. Amen. Now, despite the devil's deceptions and accusations, his power, his hatred, we can successfully resist. Somebody said, Preacher, why in the world would you say that? I said because it's biblically true. God commands us to resist. And God never gives a command that he doesn't empower you to complete. What does that mean? That means if God says resist the devil, he will flee. Within every believer is the power to resist him. Listen, I could paint a picture, tell you how beautiful he is and how great he is. But I want you to understand something. All of that would fail if God would give us just a... Just a glimpse of his glory. 
and how beautiful he is and how mighty he is. Are y'all okay? Yeah. I wanted to get a little excited there, but I had to calm down because it's Sunday and y'all are tired. Help me, Jesus. But the devil might be a coward. But you know what he is? He's persistent. As a matter of fact, in Luke, when he is tempting Jesus and Jesus does not follow his temptations, the Bible would teach us that even the enemy would say, I'll be back at another time. I'll just be back. Isn't that something? Maybe you thought as a young person, I can't wait till the devil no longer bothers me. I can't wait till the devil no longer tempts me. Now you're an older person and you're still waiting for that time to arise. Maybe you're older than old. I don't know. You're still waiting for that time to arise. Can I just tell you something? If the devil is giving you fit, be encouraged. God's got a plan for your life. Amen. Devil is not interested in anything God's not going to use. Amen. If the devil is coming against you, God's got something for you. Amen. Amen. Now, now, hmm. Wow. I think about how the devil is persistent. Peter resisted the Lord and ended up submitting to Satan. How often do we miss it? Because the truth is this. The very people that would tell me I ain't going to submit to nothing has submitted to something. I promise you. They just submitted to pride. Just the truth. Just the truth. Peter did resist the Lord. And he did submit to Satan. He denied Jesus three times. Well, you cannot overlook that. You say, preacher, I just want you to understand. I have been through some big things in my life. I too have been through some big things in my life. But often it's not the big things that get believers. It's the little things. It's the little things. Solomon will say it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Think about it. Let me do it this way. I was reading, and I've actually been here, uh, to Niagara Falls. I like the fall. I didn't think I would. I mean, when I, when I had the opportunity to go, I was a younger person. They said, do you want to go see that in Niagara Falls? I said this. I've seen water run over a rock before. I feel like I've seen it. I don't need to go there. The problem is that's the words of a fool. Uh, it's a beautiful place to go. I got to walk behind the falls, touch the falls from the back. And then you go down into the gorge into a museum and you can see some things. In that museum, you'll read about a man whose name is Bobby Leach. Bobby Leach is an Englishman. He startled the world some years ago by his feat of going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. <laughs> if he wasn't an Englishman, he'd have been from Williamsport. Amen. That's just the truth. <laughs> Out of all the modern technology, this guy picks a barrel. He came through the experience, and many do not, miraculously unscratched. I mean, what a feat. If you go down there and look, a lot of the great-looking devices that people made with all this pad and things, they don't survive. The weight of the water and the pressure is absolutely unheard of, and he absolutely does it. He walks away without a scratch. Sometime later, Leach was walking down the street, slipped on an orange peel, and, the, and it is reported that he absolutely crushed his leg. How in the world can you survive going over Niagara Falls in a barrel and slip on an orange peel? <laughs> Amen? I mean, if it had been a banana, I'd have said this ain't even real. But, but it's an orange peel. But then I am reminded that's like we are as believers. Most frequently brought down by something minor. Something minor. Something that doesn't amount to nothing. But in that moment, we let it be something much bigger than it really is. Now, here we go. So, what is the practical application of standing? It, listen now. How, how do we stand firm? Absolutely, by living in obedience. Think about that. Think about it. Now, now, let me help you with this right quick so that you understand. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in every believer will strengthen you. But now watch this. It will strengthen you to be obedient in your walk. I feel like sometimes we're asking the Holy Spirit to be Superman inside us when the truth is God's only asking you to be obedient. What does the scripture say? I'm not really interested in a great sacrifice. Just be obedient. Just be obedient. Now back up for a minute. I didn't say be obedient to a preacher. I didn't say be obedient to a church. What I said was God's asking you to be obedient to him. There's a very big difference there. I just said obedience and some of y'all just let the Spirit of God go right out the window. Where did the amens and the shouts go? Amen? A preacher, I just want you to understand there's two words in the Bible I don't like. Submit and obedient. I don't like either one of them. Why? Why do we not like them? 
I love them, but why do we not like them? To the ladies, has some man beat you down swearing that you should submit to him? Because if he has, he should understand. Before any woman should submit to any man, that man should submit to God first. Amen. And that man should love his wife just like Christ loved the church, which is sacrificially. And I believe if men would submit first, the women would be likely to easily submit next. Amen? <laughs> well, that didn't get much more either, but it'll be okay. Uh, here we go. So when I talk about being filled with the Spirit of God, standing firm, the greatest weapon we have in our warfare is not what we say to the devil, but how we live our life. Think about that. You know, too often we say a lot of things that we never, ever do. We never do. Now, I don't know about you. I, I grew up in a time where when you shook somebody's hand, that was as absolutely as ironclad as of an agreement as you could ever have had. I, I understand we don't live in that time anymore. If you don't get it inked and you don't get it notarized and three attorneys don't see it, they're backing out tomorrow. Amen? But, but we, we live in that day and time. Um, just, just, just one time, I just got to keep your attention. Just, just one time when I was growing up, as I grew, now when I was younger, it didn't work this way, but as I got a little bit older, I said to my brother one day, I said, if you do this, I'm going to hit you. And, and he said, whatever. And he did it intentionally to see if I would hit him. And you know what? I did. I did exactly what I said. I hit him one good time right there. We got home and his face was a little bit red. We sat down at the supper table. Y'all don't know what that is. It's a table where everybody sits around and eats together. Amen. We sat down at the supper table, and, and my dad looked across the table, and he saw my brother's big red head, and, and he said, uh, boy, what happened there? And my brother said, Mark hit me. And dad looked at me, and he said, Mark, what's going on? I said, dad, I told him I was going to, and if I'd have not done it, I'd have been a liar. That's all I know. <laughs> you know what he said? All right, son, that's good. Pass the beans. Amen. <laughs> Pass the beans. It's all good from here. Uh, but, but, but we grew up in that time where we meant what we said. And the truth is now we ought to do less talking in our spiritual life and more walking. Mm -hmm. Just walk it out. You say, preacher, I believe that God heals. When's the last time you had enough courage to pray from heaven for God to heal somebody? Preacher, I believe that God saves. When's the last time you've allowed God to use you and been obedient to share with somebody about the good news of Jesus? Preacher, I believe those things. I tell you, if they're not reflected in your life, you do not believe those things. And it's just the truth. Just the truth. Well, preacher, I'm so spiritual. I understand about binding this spirit and binding this spirit. I understand there's a place where we can bind spirits. But I want to tell you something. There will be no binding if you're not bowing before the king. Amen. We don't struggle in binding. We struggle in bowing. It's odd for me that, that, that even now that as I preach this and I was making notes that, that I was going, why do believers struggle with bowing to Jesus? I mean, after all, if you're born again, if you're bought by the blood of Jesus, it was in the bowing that you found him when you submitted to him. Why would you not return to bow to him daily? Oh, preacher, I read that scripture. It says, take up your cross daily. Listen, bowing before Jesus is not a cross. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. We look at this the wrong way. We give invitations here. Listen, and we're going to do it in just a minute. But we give invitations, and, 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 and I feel like sometimes people are going, Oh, God, i got to go to the altar. When it ought to be God, I get to go to the altar. I get to bow before you. And I get to lay my burdens on you. But, preacher, I just want to go be real spiritual. The most spiritual thing you can do is bow before an almighty God. Amen. That's the most spiritual thing that you can do. Now, let's do this. We're talking about standing. All in all, there's a lot bound up in this little word stand. I'm never going to get it all unpacked today, but it's okay. You see, because as the Bible tells us that you're going to have to stand, the truth is that must, we all must know that we are going to be attacked. Everybody's attacks look different. It means that we must, uh, we know that Satan's going to try to frighten us and we must not be frightened. It, it, it means that, listen now, when Satan comes, you don't have to back up. You can stand. You can absolutely just stand. It means that, listen now, we are at our position. We are on alert. It means that we do not have to give even a thought to retreat. <coughs> listen. Uh, uh, listen now. I, I love you, but, but I, I need to just do this. Well, well, preacher, I just want you to understand. Listen now. How do I do this so that I can Do you understand... You are three parts person. You are a body, a soul, and a spirit. 
Now here's what you're about to do in your mind, and I'm about to take this away from you so that you don't get to do this. Preacher, I understand that, 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 that God chose me to do mighty things, but preacher, you don't understand my hair is gray, my legs are weak, and I'm not the man I was when God said that. Amen. <laughs> but preacher, I, I just don't know where you're getting at. Well, let me help you with this. We learn in the text in Ephesians that we're not fighting with physical. But here's your problem. All of your excuses are in the physical. Mm -hmm. Say, preacher, why would you say that? Because you got none in the spirit. You got none in the spirit. Do you, do you understand? I am a spirit man. And the spirit of God is in me. So I want you to understand. Now listen, I love you. Satan might be bigger than me in some arenas. But when we step over into the spirit realm and it's God in me. Do you understand? I in Christ am more than him. And it is. In... <laughs> I got to behave. I'm about to wake y'all up. <laughs> really preacher? Yes. 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 But often we come into the house of the Lord and we're not, we're not walking spiritually. We're not warring spiritually. We're complaining physically. Amen. But preacher, I just want you to understand my toe hurts. <laughs> I love you. The Bible says if it offends you, cut it off. Let's roll on, amen. amen. Be some toes on the floor when we get ready to leave. Y'all be fine. I'm just kidding. You can keep your toes this morning. All right, here we go. Now, now I, wanna, I want you to understand the, the beauty of, of, of what it means to stand. When the enemy comes and he throws his darts at you, you can stand. When the enemy comes, because listen, I, I want you to listen now. Preacher, I don't want to stand. What do you want to do? I want to take the devil by the neck. Amen. I want to lay hands on the enemy. I want to give him a good old southern collar. Amen. I want to hold the enemy and watch his eyes get weak. I want to do, listen, listen. But you're missing the beauty of the Word of God. You don't have to do those things because the Scripture teaches us, help me, church, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus who strengthens us. In other words, God didn't build you to fight the devil. He built you to resist him because the fight with the devil has already been won. Amen. Somebody said, where's the verse that says I win? You'll never find it because he already won and you just get to be the winner. That's the beauty of the Word of God. But you got to stand. you got to stand. And listen, I, I, I love you. I wish God didn't build us for times such as this. I, I do sometimes. I wish sometimes that we were in a generation that was more God-focused. And that was more absolutely okay for you to just stand for the Lord everywhere you go and everywhere that you work. But that is not where we live. The world does not want you to stand. And if you stand, they'll call you haters. They'll say you're racist. They'll say you're sexist. They've got all of these things. Preacher, what do I do when they say those things? Very easy. Just stand. Just stand. Just stand. When I say that, i got to wonder if there's ever been a time when it was popular just to stand. Because if I go back, when Martin Luther was placed on trial for his views before the council in the German city of Worms, Amid high drama. And they said, Martin, if you'll recant, if you'll just recant, we won't kill you. I mean, you're a pretty good dude. If you'll just recant, we won't kill you. And then he speaks this phrase that will forever reign through generations. Here I stand. And I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And then they killed him. But he stood. But he stood. I just got to wonder as I let my, let my spirit walk. I just got to wonder for all of you who, who, who desire to hear God say, at the end of your journey, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Brother Mark, I want God to say that so bad. I do too. I think it's a good thing to aspire to, to hear God say those words. I'm not sure how he can as much as we've messed it all up, but I mean, let's just think, you know, we'll think positive. Maybe God still can. Are y'all okay? I feel like I'm talking to a perfect crowd this morning. Y'all might make any of the mistakes I've made, but it's okay. Uh, but, 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 but listen, when I used to think that, that, that for God to say that to me, I needed to lead more people to the Lord than Billy Graham. I needed to see more people healed than Benny Hinn in the real world. Amen. I needed, I, I need, I needed to see all these great things. But where I'm at right now in my journey, that is not what God's looking for. He's looking for people that will just stand. Amen. That'll just stand. You know, when we come to church, it's intentional why we stand in worship. Why? Because we're supposed to stand. 
in the world. Absolutely supposed to stand in the world. Brother Mark, how long am I going to have to wear this armor of God you were talking about? Because I want to be a winner for God. The Bible says in heaven we shall appear not in armor but in robes of glory. But here these are to be worn. I, 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 listen now. These, this armor is to be worn night and day. We must walk, work, and sleep in our armor or else we are not true soldiers of God. We must not confide. Listen now, listen, listen, listen. I say, preacher, what are you saying? Until I get to heaven and God puts a new robe on me, I'm going to wear my armor. That's the truth. That's the truth. One preacher said it this way. He, 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 he dissected the, the armor of God. I mean, God may lead us in that road. I don't know just yet. But he said, you got all these things in the front. There's nothing on the back. Because we've never been called to retreat. Because that would make us a coward. We've always been called to stand. Isn't it odd that, that most of you who met Jesus in, in, a, in a congregational setting met him when you were standing? If not, you had to stand. Make your way down that aisle. May we again be a people that will stand for God. Stand for God. This morning, you know what? We're about to have our altar time. Open up our altar. I'm not going to tell you anything. But I pray that if there's any spirit in you, he leads you to stand. Let's pray.